Hi, good evening and welcome here to tonight's 5 by 15, to which we're incredibly honoured to be welcoming Professor Jared Diamond. Um, Jared's book, um, Collapse, uh, came out a few years back and caused an absolute stir. It followed on from his Pulitzer Prize winning book, Guns, Germs and Steel. And if any writer could be said to have really changed the way people think about the world, what we do in it and how we abuse it, it would be Professor Diamond. He is one of the most influential writers that is around today and working absolutely at the top of his game. What is wonderful also about tonight is that it's part of the Penguin series of Green Ideas. Now these are 20 books that come in a packet and it's truly like somebody sending you a chocolate box for the mind. They're all individual and different, but I have to say, I'm absolutely thrilled that in the short series we're going to do with Penguin, we're beginning with Jared Diamond, of whom I have been a fan for, well, most of my life. Now, the bad news in all of that is that Jared is having some problems with his Zoom. So he's going to be joining us by phone, um, but we'll be putting up an image or two of Easter Island and uh, I think you'll you'll get the you'll get the full benefit of hearing him and hearing his wisdom. Um, please put uh, questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. This is a shorter session than usual because the thought was it's quite a short book and well worth reading. I can tell you it's so lucid and intelligently argued, but please put your questions in the Q&A box. And after Jared and I have talked for about half an hour, we'll come to some questions from our audience. And thank you very much, all of you, for joining up. And I couldn't recommend this too highly. So Jared, welcome from California. It's fantastic to have you here, albeit only your voice, but your voice is actually what we really want. So why did you choose to, uh, when you were invited to be part of the Green Ideas series, what, what made you come up with wanting to revisit the last tree on Easter Island? I was interested in revisiting the last tree on Easter Island because um, it is such a romantic, tragic, dramatic story, um, a metaphor possibly for planet Earth. Here is this most remote habitable scrap of land um, on Earth and small island 2,400 miles west of the coast of Chile, settled by Polynesians who um, lived there for about 500 years before Europeans first arrived, and they erected these gigantic stone statues, which nowadays industrial workers with cranes have difficulty erecting, and yet the Polynesians without cranes managed to erect these 70 ton statues, but the society then collapsed by completely destroying the forest of the island, eliminating the forest. And so it can be a parable for a worst case scenario for planet Earth isolated in the universe, just as Easter Island is an island isolated in the Pacific Ocean. That's why Easter Island grabs me and grabs other people. So when I, Easter Islanders were building these amazing statues, they must presumably have been living a life of plenty because you have time to make these extraordinary monuments. That's true. When they arrived on Easter Island, um, it was a great place because as a remote island, it was an ideal place for seabirds to have breeding colonies. There were a dozen or a couple of dozen species of, of seabirds breeding there, which meant good food for the islanders. There was the world's largest palm tree, a colossal palm tree, and at least 20 other species of trees from which to make canoes to go out onto the ocean. And so the islanders, in addition to eating all these birds, went onto the ocean and ate tunas and porpoises. Um, so there was plenty of food. They also brought along crops with them, growing sweet potatoes and taro and, and other crops, and they brought chickens. So yes, they had a good time initially. They had lots of food and they prospered and their population increased. So was there literally a moment, do you think, when someone did cut down the last tree because you're very, it's very interesting in the book because you talk about how those particular trees like the Chilean pine made these amazing canoes that could go out into the deep sea. And once they no longer had that particular kind of tree, 
their fishing options got narrower, their diet got worse, they started to fight. Do you think there was any consciousness of cutting down a tree, a last tree? That's a good question. Um, similar to questions that arise today where people destroy their environment and, and there are environmentalists who complain about it and there are others who say, don't worry, there are more of those birds left, there are more of those trees left. In the case of Easter Island, it's, uh, yeah, I've been there, it's a rather gentle landscape where you can see long distances. Um, and so people either could see that the trees were gone within eyesight, they could also walk uh, these short distances and they could ask other people. So I would guess there was a moment when they recognized that's the last tree that we're cutting down. But it may be that the person who did it didn't think of it as the last tree. That person may have thought, aha, I hear that there are some more trees over on North Beach, and this is just one more tree that I'm chopping down. So whether they were conscious of it, I don't know. But they may have been conscious. So after they had cut down this last tree and the, the, um, the society fell much more into poverty, they also started to fight, didn't they, from being a very congenial and neighborly group of tribes, as you describe it, like a cake being cut up a bit between each, each group. They then started to fight. That's true. And how do we know that they started to fight? Partly skeletal remains, partly that people, instead of living in huts, began living in caves, and partly that the landscape now is just covered with spear points um, that were used in this late stage of intertribal fighting. Also, uh, we know from the traditions of Easter Islanders, the stories that they, they told and that they recounted to Europeans visiting, um, these stories talk about the fighting and they talk about cannibalism, Mm. Uh, in the absence of canoes to go catch tuna and porpoise, the only domestic animal that they had was the chicken, and so the largest piece of meat on the island was humans. The worst insult that you could say to, to an Easter Islander, and um, this is really black humor, the worst insight in those, the worst insult that you could say in those days was, the flesh of your mother sticks between my teeth. So that was the cannibalism um, and fighting in which the society ended up. So just before we move on to the lessons we should learn from it, could learn from it, what did the society end up like? I mean, what, what did you find after this all happened? The way that the society ended up at the time that Europeans arrived, the first European arrival that is documented was a Dutch nag na navigator called Rogovin, Jacob Rogovin, on Easter Day in 1722. There may have been Spanish galleons that, that visited before, although there's no testimony to it. The first good, Rogovin was ashore for just a couple of hours, ended up fighting and killing natives and sailed off. The first good description that we got is Captain Cook in 1774. And uh, Captain Cook spent four days on Easter. His people walked all over the island. And Captain Cook described not only the big statues that Rogovine had seen, but Captain Cook also noticed that many of the big statues had been thrown down by the islanders themselves. And so within 50 years of the first sighting by Europeans, uh, the, uh, we know that the islanders were throwing down statues. The last statue that was thrown down was sometime around the 1840s or 1850s. The reason that they were throwing the statues down is that different clans fought with each other, and a victorious clan would then pull down and break the big statues of another clan, which were the ancestral figures of the clan. So basically, the society ended up in an epidemic not only of warfare and cannibalism, but a mutual destruction of the these glorious statues until by, I think, the, around 1860, the last statue was pulled down by the islanders themselves. Goodness, yes, and you, you make the point that um, pulling down statues is quite uh, common today. I mean, I know when you wrote the book, you talked about the statue of Ceausescu being pulled down, but of course, everyone can think of the statue of Saddam Hussein in Baghdad being toppled and how symbolic that was. 
That's right. We're we are going through an epic of that um, now in the United States, and I understand that you may also be doing, doing that in the U.K. Uh, within the past week, uh, the leading general of the Confederacy, of the American Civil War, the losing side, the South, the Confederacy, the leading general was Robert E. Lee, mm-hmm. um, and there was a great, a great, a big statue of Robert E. Lee uh, that just within the last week was removed and was broken in half in order to get under a freeway pass. So statues that are symbolic of a culture, if that culture is on the losing side, those statues are fair game for destruction. Yes. So you go on to talk about um, why some cultures and societies make it as such and why others don't. And you you quote um, the difference, say, between Greenland and Iceland and Greenland where the the, the Danes and the, the Vikings came and failed in, in a sense. Yeah, um, so it's a, it's a real challenge to understand, not just in the past, but also today. Why are there some societies that are taking good care of their environment, and why are there other societies that take bad care of the environment? We can see it today. Um, in the past, um, we, can, we can see, for example, different islands in the Pacific among Pacific islands, some got completely deforested. On some islands, everybody ended up dead or, or left. For example, Pitcairn Island, famous as the island to which the bounty mutineers um, uh, fled and took refuge. Um, when the bounty mutineers arrived, there were statues on Easter Island, but there were no Polynesians. The Polynesian Society of Easter Island um, had disappeared. Whereas a contrast case, a Pacific island called Tikapia, People were living on Tikopia for thousands of years. They maintained a stable society. They did it in some rather drastic ways. They limited their population because this was a small island. They limited the population either by preventing some people from reproducing or by driving excess people off into the ocean in canoes. But in the past, just as today, there are peoples who take good care of their environment and there are peoples who don't care and wreck their environment. So what do you you take from the, the moral of, or the, the story of Easter Island? I mean, something you said in a video I was watching of yours was, you said that a state like Montana is itself in trouble because of soil and air and water quality. Is that is that right? Can you say a bit more about it? Yes, so Montana is the, American, American state um, with the lowest population density, I think, south of the Canadian border. It's one of the most beautiful American states. My wife and I, and sometimes our children, spend our vacations there. It's covered with, with forest. It has wonderful um, rivers with, with fishing. Um, Montanans, um, people in the American West generally, and Montanans in particular, um, resent government interference. If the government tells you to do something in Montana, uh, people either don't want to do it or they apologize that they're following government regulations. Um, And so Montana does have have issues of of deforestation, but Montana is in in better shape um, than than some parts of California. Uh, For example, here here I am in Los Angeles, and in, in Los Angeles, much of our forest has been destroyed the state animal of California was the California race of grizzly bear, but the California race of grizzly bear was exterminated. So isn't that extraordinary that mm. have a, a, a state or a country have as its iconic animal an animal that's wonderful, but that is exterminated? Yes, that's really tragic. Um, how do you assess the, the warning signs? I mean, obviously, we, have, we, we all see warning signs, whether it's California fires or fires in Greece or floods, etc. But do you have a kind of way of rating how well a different country is doing? Um, yeah, I, yeah I, I could certainly, I and, and, and other people would rate how countries are, are doing. There are countries that have maintained their forests for example, um, Finland and Sweden have lots of forests, and their extent of forests, the Finnish forests, the forests of Finland, are extremely well managed, so that Finland's forests are not shrinking. Japan, 
um, has maintained its forests by very careful forest management. Japan, in fact, independently invented the principles of forest management, independently of Switzerland and Europe about 500 years ago. Uh, in Japan, the ex uh, this first world, this rich country, the extent of forest, Japan is about 76% covered with forest, and the amount of forest in Japan is expanding because the Japanese are taking very good care of their own forests, although they're not taking good care of other people's forests from whom they import their timber. So there are plenty of examples of countries that are taking good care, and then there are plenty of examples of, of countries that have taken bad care. Who do you see not taking care and not, not being able to see the last tree coming? Well, rather than blame other countries, uh, let me blame my own country. Um, in, the, in the United States, it is an um, ongoing fight between those who want to preserve the natural environment and those who want to destroy the, the natural um, environment. Um, uh, there, are, uh, uh, there are people in the United States, there are political parties in the United States. Uh, within the United States, uh, there, are, um, there are groups that are concerned about climate change and concerned about preservation. And there are also groups that until recently denied the reality of climate change, or if they saw climate change, said this is not due to people, but this is just due to natural fluctuations. So in the United States, we have lots of Americans who deny reality. And the fact that um, we deny reality, I mean, obviously, it's, 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 clear, it's, clear, it's clear to say drastically wrong. But why do you think we, as a species, I mean, Easter Island's not the first place that's gone, um, you know, that, that's collapsed. I mean, in your book, Collapse, you talk about many civilizations, the Mayan, North Africa, many places that also went to the brink and went over the brink. But in a way, it didn't matter so much because there were many other places in the world where humans could set up life and start all over again. Obviously, we don't have that luxury now. We've only got, as you say, Easter Island is a metaphor for our small planet in the solar system. So what is it in human minds that just does not see what's coming round the bend or chooses not to see? There are lots of reasons, why, lots of reasons. why people don't see what's coming around the bend. And these reasons are familiar to all of us in our personal lives. Um, there are people who profit, by, profit in the short run by destroying. Um, there are people who are blind because of idealistic reasons. Um, there are people who just don't see. So there are lots of reasons why, why people make bad decisions about the environment, just as there are lots of reasons why people make bad decisions about their marriages and about their jobs and about money. The differences between um, Easter Island and the world today is that Easter Island, it was isolated. And when the Easter Islanders destroyed their environment, Nobody else in the world knew about it, and nobody else in the world was affected by it. But today in our globalized world, when any part of the world, no matter how remote, when remote countries, Afghanistan, Somalia, and others, when those countries get into trouble, in our globalized world, that affects the whole world. So the risk that we face today is of a global collapse. And as for the time scale of this, um, all of your listeners who are so I'm 84 now, and all of your listeners who are under the age of 55 are going to see the outcome. We have about three decades to get onto a sustainable course, because if we've not got our planet on a sustainable course by the year 2050, this can be too late. We're not going to get on to a sustainable course. My sons, our twin sons, are going to see the outcome, and all of our listeners under the age of 50 will see whether we succeeded in managing the world's economy sustainably in a way that can go on forever, or whether we will drive over the cliff. So it's very interesting to read or listen to you again on, on talks sort of yours that I've listened to about how one of the big problems is that the global elites, which in many cases involves the politicians, 
manage to live behind gated communities, whether that is mentally or physically or whatever. And I was quite struck when you mentioned Montana because I had read something not that long ago about various very rich people buying up large chunks of Montana and New Zealand, thinking that they could go there when the rest of the world got rather unlivable. And it is true that as a politician, if you don't feel something, do you act? We have two examples of those gated communities that you, you mentioned, um, one here in Los Angeles um, and another in the middle part of the United States. In Los Angeles, we literally have gated communities. Um, those are communities of uh, wealthy people with wealthy houses with a gate across the community. Um, you have to uh, show your identification at the gate. In the gated community, uh, people get their bottled water, they get their food, uh, they have their own private security guards, they are cut off from the problems of the rest of Los Angeles. So gated communities are a symbol for how people, have, how some wealthy people think that they can protect themselves against the uh, problems of broader American society. And yet in the time that I've lived in Los Angeles, twice there have been major riots, mm. uh, starting from poor sections of Los Angeles, um, and the prospect was the rioters would would explode into the rich sections in such numbers that the gates and the police tape wouldn't keep them out. So that's one example. The other example that I'll, I'll give, which, which is so weird that it sounds funny, except that it's, it, it's black humor. Um, the U.S. had missile silos, underground missile silos, um, during the Cold War. Those missile silos um, are basically underground apartment complexes like 10 stories deep. And there are wealthy people who have bought up missile silos um, and have fitted them out underground so that if the rest of the United States goes to hell, um, they have stored stuff in their missile silo and they think that they can carry on. How long can they carry on in their missile silo, um, underground silo, with their stored food a month, a year, but they're not going to go on forever in the missile silos. But presumably it is also, I mean, I, I always imagined that, you know, when the fires got so bad in California and places like that, that that would really start to alter American politics and the same with global politics. And yet it, it doesn't seem to happen because presumably the fires get fairly near the gated communities. What, what would it take for the gated community to say, actually, this, this isn't the way to deal with the future? That's a good question. And... Uh, the picture is not entirely black. Uh, there, are, there are wealthy people and there are wealthy businesses that increasingly over the last 20 years, we talked about the bad stuff. Uh, there are lots of wealthy people and businesses that are now really concerned. For example, uh, uh, Bill Gates and Melinda Gates, who are now, now divorcing. Uh, Bill Gates and Melinda Gates, among the world's richest people, um, have set aside a foundation with something like $40 billion dollars to invest both in health and environmental efforts around the world. So there are, there are wealthy Americans who are putting a lot of money. I believe Jeff Bezos has just said that he's putting a billion dollars into environmental causes. Um, that's, that's then um, one area. The other area is big businesses. 20 years ago, if you would ask me to name what I consider the most destructive, vilest agents on planet Earth, I would have named big international businesses. But in the last two decades, um, some of these big businesses have started to recognize that their own children and their employees and the state of the world and the state of their business depends upon the world being a sustainable place. And so some big businesses, um, such as Walmart, the large American supplier, and Unilever, the large mm -hmm. seafood supplier, um, some of these big businesses uh, have become among the major agents for taking really good care of the environment for, for developing a sustainable economy because Walmart figured out that if, if fisheries are not going to be sustainable, and Unilever figured out that if the world's fisheries go extinct, there goes the business on which Unilever is based. So there are actually hopeful signs. So when the pandemic struck and you, you had a moment, I mean a completely unique moment, in that the world had to start to cooperate, um, 
you know, you now see, I mean, A, it seemed to me very optimistic that the world is able to, in a sense, turn on a sixpence, as we might say in the UK, but turn on a dime and really do something. But also, I, I was very interested in, you know, your, your analogy about the gated communities, because, for instance, in the UK now, um, people of my age are being about to be offered our third dose of the vaccine, when, of course, most of the world hasn't even had one dose of the vaccine. So what does that say about humanity, that that's how we're behaving, given that COVID is a global problem, not just a, a problem of, you know, running out of water in your little gated community? That's a really interesting point that you raise, Rosie. And on the one hand, it can make one pessimistic and exasperated. On the other hand, it can give one major cause for hope. Um, so COVID, compared to climate change and compared to resource depletion and compared to inequality, um, COVID, about which we are so wrought up, COVID, frankly, is a minor problem. Suppose everybody in the world got infected with COVID. Um, the death rate from COVID is 2%. So the worst case scenario is that COVID may kill 2% of the world's people. Whereas climate change has the potential for undermining the lifestyle of everybody on Earth. And similarly, resource depletion has the potential for ruining the lifestyles of all of us. The thing about COVID, um, climate change kills slowly and indirectly. People don't die directly of climate change. Yes, in the heat wave, some people die, but most of the deaths due to climate change are the indirect effects mm -hmm. from the, the depletion of, from the reduction of food production and from the destruction of coral reefs and tsunamis. So 200,000 Indonesians drowned in a tsunami. Um, they didn't say we drowned because of climate change. They said we drowned because of the tsunami. Uh, but why did the tsunami sweep inland? Because the coral reefs that protect the coast of Indonesia were getting destroyed. Um, COVID kills visibly and kills quickly. If you are going to die of COVID, you'll die within a week, maybe within two days. There's no doubt that you died of COVID. And so COVID has galvanized people's attention. People are also, at least some people, are starting to realize that um, nobody is going to be, no country is going to be safe against COVID until the whole world is safe against COVID. So take the UK. Suppose you vaccinated every person in the UK, um, and uh, suppose you, you do have a very good health service. Um, does that mean that the UK is going to be protected forever against COVID? Of course not, because there's, mm -hmm. there's travel. Uh, people are going to will still be coming into the UK, and even people who are vaccinated are at some risk. The world is, nobody is going to be safe against COVID. No country will be safe against COVID until the whole world is safe against COVID. But that's also true for climate change. If in the United States or the UK you say climate change is a problem, we're going to deal with it by, redu by reducing our consumption of fossil fuels and reducing the carbon dioxide levels over London. Well, Reducing the carbon dioxide levels over London isn't enough because the winds mix the carbon dioxide levels around the world. And so climate change also is a global problem requiring a global solution. In short, what I see of COVID is the hope that people will recognize here's a global problem that requires a global solution, and maybe they will then generalize and recognize that much more serious global problem, namely climate change, will require, do require global solutions. And so perhaps finally, we will get galvanized after COVID to mounting a global effort, not just against COVID, but also against climate change and resource depletion. And that's my best case scenario. So just before we be begin um, the questions, which are coming in thick and fast and do keep sending them, do you think we have in any way the right structures in place, such as the, you know, the COP, the climate, the conference of the parties, the biodiversity conferences. Do we have the right structures in place to start to deal with this? Sure, we have the right, right structures. Um, uh, we, we have WHO for, for um, uh, health issues. Um, there, there are plenty of right structures. Um, what, is, what is simply lacking is the, the conviction on the part of enough people um, that the things have to be done. 
So, for example, in the in the United States, there are people, many people, maybe 30 percent of Americans who deny COVID and resist vaccination. There are lots of still lots of Americans who deny um, climate change. What's required is not new structures. What's required is the 30 percent who deny COVID um, to get converted, perhaps by having uh, having enough uh, illness in their own families that they will wake up. In short, we don't require new structures. We just require more people in the world to get convinced. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to bring in some questions. Um, David Oakley Hill asks, what's the most powerful argument or incentive that we can use to stop big business cutting down rainforests, which, as he says, support so much of the world's fabric of biodiversity? What's the most powerful argument that we can use, David, to, to convince um, people not to chop down rainforests? There are many arguments, but one of those, one of the arguments, and this is a strong argument, is that rainforest generates climate. Rainforest is not just beautiful with monkeys and beautiful birds, something pretty to look at. Rainforest is a major generator of climate. And so the destruction of the Amazon rainforest, the ongoing destruction, is creating spreading drought in Brazil and drought in the, in the Amazon basin. So a strong argument for convincing people to stop cutting down rainforests is that this is bad for people. It's not just bad for pretty birds, but it's bad for the livelihood of people and it's bad for agriculture in the Amazon basin. Thank you. Um, Greg Jan asks, in 2018, the Intergovernmental Panel on the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, said that we only had until 2030 to cut global CO2 emissions in half in order to avert catastrophic climate change. So he's, he's picking up on your point when you said we've got three decades. He's saying, don't we only have nine years in which to quote, get our act together? Good, good question, Greg. Do we have nine <laughs> years or do we have, have 30 years? Um, it's, a, it's difficult to make the prediction um, because in the case of climate change, there are amplifying factors. Um, as the world gets warmer, will the Greenland ice cap and will the Antarctic ice cap suddenly collapse, in which case things will get worse in a hurry? Or will the Antarctic ice cap carry on for a while, in which case it's slower? Um, do we have until 2030 or do we have until 2050? I use the number 2050 as a rough number because at the rate that things are going, the world's fisheries, the world's far, so many things are getting depleted that we'll run out of them in about 30 years. So I think of the year of 2050 as our um, drop dead deadline. But it's true that if we don't have climate change fixed by the year 2030, what one can say, Greg, is the sooner we solve climate change, um, the easier it will be, and the longer we wait, the harder it will be. Yes, absolutely. And again, it comes back to the sort of short sightedness of um, certainly politicians in your country and our country who are, have their eye on the next election so quickly. So it's such a short uh, time scale. Um, Linda Bond sends in a good question here. Since those who benefit most from destruction, e.g. get the money, are financially able to avoid many of the consequences, it appears that the burden of beneficial change in our processes is in the hands of the rest of us. So her question is really, how do we best act to make changes when those with the financial capability to help are often unwilling to do so. And I know you, you mentioned the Walmarts and the Unilevers, but um, I guess she's also thinking of people like Bolsonaro and other people that are really not doing very much to help. Right, uh, I'd answer Linda's question in, in two ways. Uh, what can people in, in, in rich European and North American countries do um, in their own countries, and what can we do for the rest of the world? Um, in our own countries, this is more, more an issue in the United States, I think, than in the UK. Um, the turnout of Americans to vote in elections is shockingly low. I don't know how bad it is in the UK, but the most recent presidential election of 2020 had the, the highest turnout of any modern 
American presidential election. It was somewhat above 60 percent. It might have been as high as 70 percent. But 70 percent, that's ridiculous. That means 30 to 35 percent of Americans couldn't be bothered to vote, whereas in countries like Italy and Indonesia, 93 percent of Indonesians turned out to vote for the first election, well, the first democratic election. So one thing that we can do is vote. If we don't, if we don't vote, because the parties differ in their policies, if we don't, if 30 percent of us, 40 percent of us don't vote, of course we're likely to end up with bad policies. That's one thing. As for other countries, the world is interconnected. Um, um, five countries or entities control something like 65 percent of the world's resources, and those entities are Europe, including the EU, including including the UK as a recent part of the EU. The United States, Japan, China, and India, those five entities can, um, control something like 65% of the world's economy, which means that if those five entities would agree among themselves about policies for climate change, for example, they could then require the other 35% of the world that did not want to cooperate to cooperate if they want to trade with UK, Europe, Japan, India, China. And while China and the United States have plenty of conflict, China and the United States also have some areas of agreement about climate change, which is a big problem for China as it is for the United States. Right. Yes, no, that's that's really interesting. Um, there's a question here from Paul Kay about actually going back to Easter Island. Um, and there's another question also about from Sin Sinclair Lang, which go back to Easter Island. One, Sinclair Lang's is about now that we know uh, as a society, as scientists, that we know much more about the impacts of invasive species and parasites, for instance, Dutch elm disease, how do we know that the trees weren't destroyed by natural events versus being destroyed by people cutting them down? And Paul Kay asks, which kind of goes along with this, should or could Easter Island be replanted or reforested or should it be left alone? So I sort of brought those two together. Right, really interesting question. Could Easter Island be reforested? Yes, it could be reforested, but not with the original trees because they are extinct. The world's biggest palm tree was the Easter Island palm, uh, but that species is extinct. So we will not reforest Easter Island with Easter Island palm trees. Um, then um, on the, so, so on the other question, uh, I've now, uh, I've, found myself just so emotionally involved with that thought of the Easter Island palm tree. Uh, could you could you repeat the first question oh, yes. that I... Of course. No, it, it's an interesting question. I mean, he's saying that because we now understand a lot about um, invasive species, I mean, for instance, in the UK, we've had Dutch elm disease and we have almost no elms left and different things have been transported. And I know, you know, you have Colorado beetle in pines in the Rockies and different things like he's asking if it's possible that Easter Island got in, infected, I'm not sure if that's the right word, but anyway, infected by an invasive species, rather than it was uh, some person, probably a man, who chopped down the last tree. The answer to that question is no, it is not possible. <laughs> Why do I say that so dogmatically? I say that dogmatically because the archaeological record shows that Easter Island had been forested for thousands, hundreds of thousands of years through climate fluctuations. And then along came people. And within a few centuries after the arrival of people, this forest had been thriving for hundreds of thousands of years was, was destroyed. And mm -hmm. it was destroyed. How was it destroyed? The, the trunks of the, of the Easter Island palm tree, the trunks show ax marks on them and they are burnt. Well, beetles do not have axes, <laughs> and beetles do not light fires. So it's clear that what eliminated the Easter Island palm tree was people with axes and fires. Well, that's very interesting to know, and actually I suppose if you think about it, but the, the whole question now of invasive species is extremely difficult. Um, so there's an interesting question here, which um, we're sort of coming up to our three quarters for now, and it's a, it's a big, broad question. It's from someone called JM, who might or might not be Jim, I don't know, but I'd like to say thank you for this question, 
you said Brazil's economy would be humongous if its natural resources, which benefit us all, had a monetary value. So that is a, I mean, that's a very big question about how we value nature. Um, in the UK, we have recently, uh, the government, uh, the treasury, in fact, uh, commissioned a report called the Das Gupta Review, which set out to look at the economic value of nature and what we were losing and what in a way we owed to the earth and the soil and the sky and the trees, etc. So do you think that that is a good way for the world to go forward? I mean, obviously it would start to include carbon taxes and different ways of assessing the value of anything from the food that we eat to the clothes that we wear. Jim, you raised, an, that's a really great point that you raised, Jim. Um, the, the term that biologists apply um, to the effect that you're talking about is what's called ecosystem services. That means that natural ecosystems provide services. They do things for us people, and they do things at no cost. Uh, for example, um, streams, um, rivers, and the plants in rivers and the microorganisms in, in rivers, um, those are what generate clean water or earthworms. Earthworms generate soil. Um, in China, um, the, uh, the, the use of chemicals and other things depleted the earthworm population by something like one third, which has resulted in decreased agricultural um, production in China. Um, a, a, Monetary example, a dollar example to give to, give to Jim is the, the city of New York, so one of the largest American cities, possibly our largest city. The city of New York was considering building water purification plants, which would have cost something like $6 billion. And biologists made the point, but there are forests um, in the Catskill Mountains near New York City within 100 miles of New York, and those forests the forest themselves, the vegetation in the forest, cleans the water. And therefore, if instead of spending $6 billion on water purification plants, we spent $1 billion to convince landowners to preserve their forests, we could get clean water for New York perpetually at a cheaper cost. And New York City bought the economic argument instead of instead of spending six billion dollars for water purification plants, they spent one billion dollars to preserve forests along rivers, and the result was good water quality for New York City for the indefinite future. That's an example of ecosystem services, namely nature giving us things for free, giving us clean water, clean air, productive soil doing things for free that otherwise we would have to spend money ourselves to do. That's a great example. I love that. I didn't know that. That's so interesting. I, I, I have to, there's one more question before we close because it's slightly irresistible coming, given what we've just been talking about. It's from Ben and he says, do you think it may be fair to posit that gun steel and indeed the industrial plants making them may be justly stroke and helpfully understood as being living invasive parasitic organisms themselves and, and how he adds indeed the axes as in, as in Easter Island. So let me try restating that to make sure that I understand it correct. Should, should we think of, of steel Well, could we think of that as, in, as a way as being like an invasive species because they have altered the world to such an extent? Well, th th that's, a, that's a metaphor. Um, uh, if, if it mobilizes um, some public support for reducing destruction by technology, by all means, think of technology as an invasive species. Um, as a biologist, I think of invasive species as being invasive species without any parallels. And I, see, and I personally um, see other arguments against human technology. Uh, rather than making the metaphor to invasive species. But um, uh, I want the world of my sons 30 years from now to be a stable world, a sustainable world. And whatever it takes to convince people, um, if you would like to think of tools as invasive species, and that will help 
the generation of my sons and all of your listeners under the age of 60 to have a sustainable <laughs> world, by all means, think of tools as invasive species. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. You've been just amazing. I'm really sorry we couldn't see your face moving. I've had your face in front of me, though. And indeed, the book cover of this fantastically good The Last Tree on Easter Island, which I couldn't recommend too highly. Um, thank you all very, very much for joining us. Thank you all very much indeed for your questions. We managed to get to quite a few. And we'll be back with more um, stories and interviews from this fabulous penguin series which do go into your bookstore and have a look and anyway just to say thank you very very much to professor jared diamond you're extremely wise and your wisdom is very very valuable always has been and now seems absolutely critical to understanding the present so thank you for your work and for joining us tonight and good night good night